I'm all spiffy. I've got a Madonna mic. I'm all ready to go. Everybody excited? Woohoo! So, uh, there were some questions around what the talk was going to be about. Um, and uh, because, you know, I failed to get the um, uh, abstract in on time because I'm organized like that. And uh, so the guys, you know, I sent them the abstract and they're like, oh yeah, that looks great. So it's all about the internet of things. Um, so uh, first, because you guys haven't heard enough of, uh, from me and about me, uh, I am Josh Holmes and I work for Microsoft. Um, I have, uh, for the last 10 months or so, been working on a team called the Strategic Engagements Team. And it's a very exciting new team at Microsoft uh, we work almost exclusively with startups and with innovation labs within, within large companies. So uh, we work with innovators regardless of where they are. And you know, so we don't work with BMW. We work with the innovation lab at BMW. We don't work with Adidas. We work with the innovation lab at Adidas. We also work very closely with the startups that are in the Microsoft Ventures Accelerator and other startups around the world. Uh, so we're working very closely with a lot of guys in the Valley. We're working very closely with a lot of the guys in Tel Aviv. We're working very closely with people in New York, in Atlanta. Um, I've got a startup in Iceland that I've been working with. Um, they're very exciting. They're doing a, um, a smart glucometer, uh, and it's it's a uh, which is a, a blood glucose you know blood sugar reader, and uh, it, it, they're they're trying to change the way that doctors and patients interact. And I love this because they're, doing, they're using technology to help change the world and help change the way that we interact with the other people around us, the people that we interact with anyway. We're just trying to make that a better conversation so that instead of when a diabetic patient goes in to see their doctor, they go, oh, it's been, you know, good, it's been okay, it's been bad, and here are my last five readings. Instead, the doctor can actually look at every single reading that they've had over the last six months, last year, since their last checkup. And they're looking at using a lot of other sensors, not just blood sugar, but they're also looking at blood pressure. They're looking at galvanic sensors so they can check minerals in the, in the sweats. They're looking at um, oxygen sensors. They're looking at all kinds of different sensors all around the body to help understand how does, the, how does the body react and how to this medicine or that medicine or to diets? And how does that change the conversation with the doctor? And what I loved about this is that it's actually, this is something they were going to have to do anyway. They were going to have to prick their finger and test their, their, their blood sugar. But we're gathering so much more information and making that experience so much more valuable Rather than I get to see the number, my doctor gets to see the chart of that over time. And so I'm getting, I'm, I just get goosebumps when I start talking about, you know, the startups that we're working with. This is a three-man shop out of Iceland. They're going to try to change the world. And uh, they're called Metalink. They're awesome. Uh, check them out. Um, so that's what I do. The other exciting part, and this is, this is a sentence that took me like a month to parse even after I was in the job. Microsoft pays me full-time to write open-source software. Seriously, everything that I do starts with a GitHub repository, typically MIT or Apache 2 license, depending on the, on the project. Um, but everything that, that, we, that my team does, and there's a team of about 80 of us. Uh, we are hiring, by the way, just in case you're interested. Um, and uh, you know we're, we're scattered across the world, so we've got about 20 people in Redmond. We've got uh, about a dozen down in the valley. We've got uh, some people up along, up and down the east coast. We also have 14 people in Finland. We've got um, one person in Tel Aviv right now. We're looking for four more, uh, I think. And we've got another uh, four in London, and are looking for about a dozen more in London. Uh, so if you guys are in those places and interested. Contact details, just let, let you know. Uh, so, as you guys can see, I'm subtle, like a sledgehammer. So, uh, so that's, that's me um, and the team that I work on. Um, the last 10 months or so have been focused on the Internet of Things. The reality is, 
I've been doing embedded and small device programming for years and years and years and years. Um, I started out, uh, the first embedded device that I worked on was a Windows CE device uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000 era. Uh, and you know, these are you know, little handheld devices. Uh, you can still see a lot of them in grocery stores. Uh, if you see somebody in a grocery store scan a barcode with a big giant handheld device made by Symbol Technologies, software I wrote is on that. Okay, so I've, I've changed the way your groceries are delivered and priced. It's exciting. But there was a very exciting thing that happened in the year 2008. And that exciting thing was the world's population was matched by the number of internet connected devices in the world. That's a, seven billion people in the world, not all of them have internet connected devices, but in 2008, we matched the world's population. Now what happened in 2007 that helped precede this, that helped, helped lead to this? The iPhone, which was the iPhone the first smartphone? This is the audience participation side of this. Uh, you guys should be used to audience participation with me at this point in time. So was the, was the iPhone the smart, first smartphone? Who had a Palm device? Handful of people. Who had one of the higher end Symbian devices? Okay. Who had the um, IBM Simon? Anybody remember the IBM Simon? Okay, maybe I'm the only old guy in the room. I don't know. So the IBM Simon was the first smartphone. Okay, this was in 1993. It's a long time ago, before some of you were born. Makes me sad, okay? So, smartphones were not a new thing. But what did Apple do that, that really made this an exciting time? They helped consumerize it. And it was the design sense that led that, that helped consumerize those devices and moved it from the uber tech, turbo nerd type of world into my grandma can pick it up and actually use it, okay? I mean, so that's what happened at that point in time. And so from there, devices have just exploded. I mean, think back to 2008. Most of us, most of us probably had a laptop and a phone. Is that, is that about right, everybody? Okay, now, who had a tablet in 2008? Okay, I did. But most people didn't have a tablet back in 2008. Now, people have tablets, they have phones, they have all kinds of different devices. I'm, my watch is internet connected. This is the Microsoft Band, and uh, it, it, it is internet connected and uh, you know, feeds me a lot of great information. Um, it's pulling a lot of data from, from me and you know, my heart rate, uh, which is elevated at the moment. Um, how many steps I've taken. Uh, this MC work is, is hard. I've already done 11,000 steps today, just in this room. <laughs> so, and I'll probably do another 6,000 because I, you know, all over the place. Um, but everybody in this room has at least two, if not 12. I counted up at my house and, and, and my, my lovely wife back here, do this for a minute, la 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 la, okay. Um, I counted 47 internet connected devices at my house alone, okay? Now, people are giggling, it's probably you too. <laughs> now, I have a little bit of an exception there because I've got uh, multiple teenagers, uh, 18, 16, uh, 14, um, all of whom have game consoles, laptops, and smartphones of their own. But we also are looking at our cable box, our uh, routers, um, our, you know, all the different devices in the home. You know, there's security systems, there's smoke detectors, there's garage door openers, there's thermostats, there's all kinds of different devices that are available in the home these days that are, you know, internet connected. If you just look four years ago, five years ago, this is kind of what the Internet of Things looked like. And in a very short amount of time, it's just exploded, okay, into all kinds of different devices. Now. 
What does that mean in practicality? What does it mean to me when I am at home? Okay? What it means to me is that when I get home, I, want, I don't want to have to connect my phone to my thermostat. I mean, that, that's cute. It's interesting. But really what I want is I want to step beyond those interactions. And when I walk into my home, I want my house to recognize me. I want my house to see, oh, that's Josh, and he's in a bad mood. And so we're going to put a little bit of metal. Crash it. Turn the lights down a little bit. Or I want my house to recognize me and go, oh, that's Josh, and he's in a good mood. Okay? And so when he's in a good mood, we're going to put a little blues, a little funk. But this is beyond what the guys were talking about in the last talk. I mean, I love the last talk. I absolutely adored the last talk. It was an energizing talk for me to think about the future and the future of these interactions. But the further I get into this, the more I want, I want, the, I want the technology to blend into the background. I don't want to have to wear some kind of device. I mean, I, I don't wear watches, but I've been trying to get used to the Microsoft Band because it's interesting and there's a lot of good data coming off of it. But it's still, I, I, I get this thing on my hand. It's, ah! I don't want to have to do that. And I don't want to have to deliberately go interact with things. I want those things to recognize me and make my life smarter, make my life better. And so, it's, actually, one slide too, too soon. Um, but there's a lot of places where this is going to be a lot smarter and a lot more interesting. Um, I really like the iRobot uh, movie and the self-driving cars. Because now all of a sudden, I have that option of driving myself, but I also have the option of sitting back and let the technology just handle it for me. Now that doesn't happen in a world where we have a single self-driving car. A single self-driving car that is aware of the surroundings within 50 feet of it is not safe, I don't think. I think where it becomes more safe is when all the cars start being networked together and all those cars are able to talk to each other and are able to tell each other about issues that are coming up. And so we have this mesh of the connected cars that are all talking to each other and making each other safer. That's where it starts getting really interesting. And again, you know, the technology is sliding into the background. When I call my mechanic and I tell my mechanic that there's something wrong with my car, and, and, and we've all done this, okay? I tell them, what, you know, there's something wrong with my car, and they say, well, what, 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 what's the symptoms? They say, well, it's making a noise. Well, what kind of noise? What do we always do? And we're on the phone trying to describe this noise to them. Well, what if the car was able to sense what's going on, what's wrong, and preemptively call my mechanic and tell my mechanic, hey, my alternator's failing. And my mechanic can schedule a meeting with me, and I don't even have to be involved. My, my car can just go be fixed. And when it comes back, it's better, and it's exciting, and it stops making that noise. And I'm all excited because I didn't have to interact with it. That's the world of the Internet of Things, where systems, not just individual things, systems are working together to make our lives better. That's the vision of the future that I'm really excited about with the Internet of Things. Now, there's a couple of things that have happened that have made technology possible here. And the, the, the Internet of Things has really started to explode. The Internet of Things is not a new thing. Just like the smartphone goes all the way back to 1993, the Internet of Things is not a new thing. It's just a new buzzword and it's a new label and it's exciting. But there's some things that have made it really exciting right now. One of them is, this is the Raspberry Pi 2. This is an example of what's happening on the small end. So on the small end, these computers are becoming much smaller 
much more powerful, and we're really able to do a tremendous amount with these little bitty, itty bitty microcontrollers and embedded devices, okay? So the Raspberry Pi 2, it ships with embedded Linux, and so, and it's a full-blown computer at that point in time. Um, it, uh, you, you can even, you can install Windows 10 on it, um, but this is a 900 megahertz quad-core machine that fits in the palm of my hand. Now, let's think back, not terribly long ago, and I'm not that old, but these are my first four CPUs. Okay, so this one over here, anybody know what that one is? I'm seeing a couple of nods, but nobody's brave enough to say, yeah, it's the, it was an, it was an 8286. Okay, it's so an old 286. Uh, anybody have any idea how many megahertz it operated at? Now, just a 900 megahertz quad core machine, the 286 was running at, anybody? Three? No, it was, it was faster than three. Slightly slower than 16, it was 12 and a half megahertz. It was a 16-bit, 12 and a half megahertz processor. And it ran DOS uh, 6.3 really well. I was very excited about DOS 6.3. Uh, my next machine was a 486DX. And this one was screaming powerful. I was really amazed. Because I, I mean, it was, it, was, it was awesome. At 50 megahertz, okay? My next machine actually had a lot more megahertz than that. I, I jumped into the Pentium class after that, and the Pentium class there, uh, my, I think my, my Pentium was 1.2 uh, gigahertz. So I mean, big jump from the 50 megahertz. It was like, oh, yeah. And so, and then we jumped over to the extreme, and the extreme, the Pentium extreme was, um, I'm trying to remember, it was almost two gigahertz uh, dual core. I was very excited about the dual core. It meant that I could do two things at the same time. But let's remember, this is a quad core machine that fits in the palm of my hand and costs $35. And that's US money, it's not even real money. And this fits in the palm of my hand. And that little computer right there, that little chip is the embedded Linux system on a chip hard and ready to go operating system, runs on this little board, but you can get chips very similar to that for very cheap. There's a company I've been working with uh, called uh, Dog Hunter. Uh, they are, well, they've got an international presence. Um, oops, there we are. And um, they, uh, they have a Linux system on a chip that comes with Wi-Fi, B, G, and N. They have upcoming versions that have got more radios than that. Um, and it's ready to go, drop on a board, and I can buy these for $11 a piece if I'm buying them in quantity. And, and it's, it's about the size of the two euro piece. Okay, so slightly bigger than a quarter. It's really small. If you've seen the Arduino Yoon, the little silver box on the Arduino Yoon, that, that's a Lenino chip from Dog Hunter. Um, and so these, you know, on the one hand, Devices and computers are getting much smaller, much more powerful all at the same time and incredibly cheap. So I can start embedding these things in things like toothbrushes and eyeglasses and all kinds of different weird places um, and, and have amazing uh, functionality and power. On the other hand, uh, oh sorry, and Windows 10 from Microsoft. Um, but on the other hand, cloud computing is becoming more ubiquitous. Okay, and, and you know, somebody earlier, uh, I'm not gonna call anybody any, ouch, Jeremy, and uh, he said bullshit when I said, when he said, you know, we're talking about cloud, but the reality is cloud computing has fundamentally changed how we are doing work on the internet. It has all of a sudden democratized access to incredibly powerful computing because I don't have to worry about, you know, buying 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 dollars worth of hardware and standing that up or signing a two-year, three-year, four-year lease on extremely expensive hardware and potentially betting my company and my house and 
you know, my dog and, you know, everybody else on this lease. Okay, what cloud computing has done is it meant that for 20 bucks, I can stand up a service and get my first customer. However, that exact same architecture, that exact same uh, access, when I get to 500,000 customers, I've just scaled up and, and I can directly attach my spending to my usage. And so that is incredible. And it's that hourly lease and that very, very um, incremental, you know, I'm, I, I need this much more, so I'm gonna buy that much more just, just right now. And I can spin it up right now. And oh, I don't need it anymore, I can turn it off right now. That has democratized access to giant infrastructure and you know the 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 likes of which uh would have taken us hundreds of thousands millions of dollars to go build ourselves okay so the small end all the way to the big end we have now democratized access to that and i can pick up the phone and call somebody in tingen today and have a device prototyped and on my desk on friday and connected to a cloud infrastructure that I don't own, that I just rented Friday afternoon, and have customers on Saturday. <laughs> That's exciting. So the future is now. It's just not evenly distributed, okay? So this is the way we look at the Internet of Things uh, at Microsoft. And uh, big eye chart, don't, don't worry about reading it. Uh, the slides are available, just, uh, just, just drop me a note. Um, but we look at all kinds of different devices that are out here, uh, from fire detection to you know, uh, smart vehicles and device tracking and that kind of stuff, to cameras and smart grids and um, home automation, temperature sensors, all kinds of different devices. And all of these devices are sending data into some type of an infrastructure of the back end. We obviously prefer Azure Cloud, you know, our side. Uh, but, you know, in general, when you're talking, talking about Internet of Things, all these devices are sending stuff into the back end, and they're doing so for monitoring and, and telemetry data. Then, what we can do is we can remotely access these devices, we can remotely send them content and uh, get access to, you know, give them access to the back end, and then also configuration management. Okay, so let's apply that in different verticals. So automotive, retail, industrial, et cetera. Um, and we're able to apply that across a number of different uh, verticals. Now, Microsoft, we're not building vertical solutions, we're building horizontals. So we're building things in this layer, okay? Letting you develop these devices and you develop in the vertical different sections, okay? Now we're happy to help, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the, uh, the idea is that uh, you have your devices, that's proprietary, that's your information, and the data on the back end, how you process it, and how you analyze it, that's also your stuff. Everything else in between is kind of plumbing, okay? And so that's, that's what I've been working on, is a lot of the plumbing stuff in between. But let's apply some of this to my smart home. Okay, as I come home, and you know, and, and my house starts recognizing me, it's sending pictures of me in good, bad, indifferent, happy, elated, you know, miserable, all kinds of different emotions. It's sending pictures of me into the back end, and we're able to analyze those with cloud computing, with machine learning, and start recognizing when I'm in what kind of a mood. Once we're able to do that, and then more accurately discern that, we're able to start applying additional analytics to say, well, when he's in a good mood, when he's in a bad mood, when he's in a miserable mood, then all of a sudden we can start looking at what other data can we apply. So what are his music choices? What are his lighting choices? What are his food choices? What are his drink choices? And start preparing that type of information ready to go for, for me, to make my life better. And that makes me happy. And hopefully, as you guys step into that home, 
it would start recognizing you and start preparing your music, whether you like Bach or, you know, Beethoven, you know, then that's, that's a big religious war. And, you know, we're going to pick the right music for you. And we're going to turn on the right TV station. And we're going to turn on the right movies. We're going to turn on the right kind of lighting. We're going to turn on, you know, the, the, you know, you're in a bad mood. We're going to go ahead and call the suicide hotline right now. That's a joke. Okay. Making sure everybody's still with me. So, now, why is this interesting to, at, at, at large? Um, if you look at the commercial airline space, uh, if we can just do 1% fuel savings over the next 15 years, that's $30 billion. So, if the airline industry spends $29 billion on Internet of Things so they can get better information and better data, they've saved a billion dollars. That's pretty good. Okay. Now, the average flight, this is an interesting little trivia fact that I found out the other day, uh, the average flight, if you look at it, um, you know, takes off, flies, lands, during that time, it produces a terabyte worth of data. That's a lot of data. So how are you going to process that and manage that, and how do you turn that data into knowledge? Okay. Um, if you look at the gas fire generation, you know, home uh, energy savings, 1% fuel savings at home over the next 15 years is $66 billion. Even though that's U.S. currency, that's still real money when you're talking about those kind of numbers. Okay? Um, healthcare, 1% fuel savings in addition to all the lives that we can save. Okay? And all the, all the ways that we can make people's lives better. $63 billion. Again, huge numbers when we start talking about that. Uh, transportation system, $27 billion. I mean, we can keep going and going um, until, you know, we exhaust that list. But it's a huge opportunity and huge industry. But what really matters is you have devices that provide data, okay, and you need to understand uh, the rules and the models and, and, and how those things flow and hopefully be able to change your business and change how you interact with the people around you and the systems around you. Okay? And so that is, that is at, a, at a high level how we look at uh, Internet of Things. Um, and so Azure services for uh, the IoT, um, we've got a number of different uh, uh, verticals that we've been looking at, but again, we're building horizontals, but in general, you have devices that are attaching and sending data in. Um, there's a number of different protocols here. AMQP is one of them, um, but there's also MQTT, CoAP, WAMP, a bunch of different types of protocols. Uh, they talk to some type of a gateway. Those gateways are, um, sometimes those are on-premise, sometimes those are in the cloud. Um, the, uh, we've actually seen a lot of interesting uses for uh, on-premise uh, gateways. The on-premise gateways, um, uh, what they do is they're going to take very small devices that are not very intelligent, and we're going to be able to aggregate the data, and we're going to be able to securely send that from the field gateway in. Um, but I've been working a lot on the edge devices. And the edge devices, uh, even though they're becoming smaller and more powerful, there's a tremendous number, tremendous number of existing devices out there that are too small to do some of the things that we take for granted. So, for example, uh, if you look at the Arduino um, uh, Uno, the Arduino Uno has 2K of flash memory. Think about optimizing for under 2K of memory. Um, the Arduino Due, which is a fairly beefy kind of a device, has 96K of flash memory. We're pretty excited about 96K of flash memory now. And Yet, when we started looking at some of the security protocols and we were trying to get um, SSL, TSL, down to fit on the Arduino Due, we were able to strip it down and get it down to pre-shared keys. And the pre-shared keys library, so we're not even doing the handshakes and everything else that SSL does up front, just the PSK side of it, uh, we were able to get it down to 36K, which doesn't fit on the Arduino Une. And it 
fits on the Arduino Due, but it's still, that's, a, that's over a third of our application memory. And so that severely limits what we're able to do. And by the time we get that and a couple more libraries, we're out of space on, on the Arduino Due. So, on premise, we have been you know, looking at, well, what kind of security can we provide? And, uh, you know, and some of that's gonna be physical, some of that's gonna be software, but we can provide that data into a field gateway, and then the field gateway is able to um, uh, talk securely back into the back end. Um, on the back end, we've got a lot of different types of processing. Uh, so some of this you guys will have uh, seen and, and, and been using already, so um, Hadoop, uh, being able to do MapReduce on large amounts of data to start looking for patterns and that type of thing. Um, machine learning. Machine learning is a very exciting uh, new space. Uh, I, could, I, I would love to stand up here and spend like six hours talking about machine learning. I think I would lose many of you. Um, but it's very, it's an, it's an exciting space to me. Um, so in Azure, one of the things we have with Azure ML is we've opened up the same machine learning engine that we use for Bing and Cortana and those things as a service that you guys can just use and call. And uh, you're charged on the compute when it's actually running, uh, but you're not charged on, on hosting the vast amounts of machines that we're um, uh, run, uh, using to, to, to run all that. Um, one example there is that we've got a customer, a uh, German company, uh, they have 44 petabytes worth of data. Um, that was a number I had a hard time wrapping my head around. And so I started looking up other large amounts of data and trying to figure out what large amounts of data look like. If you take a snapshot of the web today, every website, every public URL, every pu everything, and this is what Google and, and, and Bing and, and so on, you know, these big search engines, this is what they do. Um, they're gonna take a snapshot of all that. That is 14 petabytes. And this company has 44 petabytes worth of data. That's a lot of data. <laughs> and so how do you process that? And so this is where cloud computing comes in because they don't own the hardware that can process that, but they can rent it. They can rent it pretty cheaply. And so we've looked at being able to drop the cost of storing the data on premise from kind of three million, four million a year down to less than 300,000. And we're able to do the processing of 44 petabytes worth of data and turn data into knowledge, into actionable knowledge that is gonna help them interact with their customers better and help them uh, run their business better. And so we're able to do that you know, through the power of, of, uh, of, of Azure ML there. Uh, and then we're gonna publish all that data, um, you know, it, the customers will end up being able to publish that data and service that data through many different types of service portals and third parties. Now, what have I been doing? Um, so I've given you the kind of the grand vision. One of the implementations from Microsoft of the um, uh, kind of the plumbing in the middle is nitrogen. Okay, so nitrogen, uh, there's the GitHub URL. Um, those in the front seat, I'm not sure if you can see it. It's there, I promise. <laughs> uh, so it is github.com slash nitrogenjs, um, and it's one of the implementations of the reference architecture from the Azure IoT team. Um, it's a open source project, so it's not a product from Microsoft. It's just an open source project. It's written in Node.js. Um, and so it's NPM installable, it's up on uh, GitHub, obviously, I talked about that. But at a high level, this is the, the architecture of it. So we have four different servers. We've got a front door that kind of normalizes all the APIs, and then there's ingest, which uh, is on this side. Down here, it's over here. Up there, it's over there. Um, ingest, which is gonna take REST, uh, MQTT, AMQP, we're looking at other protocol gateways. Uh, takes that and feeds that into Event Hub. Uh, Event Hub is a new ingest engine um, in Azure that is able to do very, very high scale. And by high scale, I mean each Event Hub is able to do one gigabyte per second of ingest. That's a lot. Um, we got one customer who's pushing four gigaseconds over six Event Hubs, because you can have more than one. Um, 
Then we take all that data, we're gonna push um, uh, some portion of it to Mongo, uh, but we also push a lot of it to table storage, uh, NRT, Storm, um, uh, Stream Analytics, different real-time analytics engines, uh, and then we also push to, um, these are all configurable, uh, HD Insight or um, machine learning. We also do message routing back and subscriptions back to the, uh, to the individual devices. But we're doing all the plumbing for, for people to do telemetry data in, command and control out, messaging, and then there's a principle-based authorization system in the middle that manages access to and permissions to all the different devices. What this allows you to do is start thinking about the creative parts. So you get to work on the device's end. You get to work on, uh, you know, what are these different devices going to be? How, where are they? Uh, how are they situated? How are they configured? And then you get to on the back end, so on the back end of Event Hub here, you get to put in your own providers that start looking at what are the rules? What are the models? What's the, what's the uh, interaction between the different devices? And plug into the machine learning and get the intelligence. And so start doing really creative and intelligent things. And I'm excited about seeing what you guys are able to do with it. And feel free to reach out to me and, and um, uh, send me questions, send me help. Um, it is a GitHub uh, project, uh, open source. We're looking for contributions. So if you get up there and you're confused about something, please reach out. Please send us pull requests. Um, and really, that's what I've got today. So with that, thank you. <laughs>